AI pretends to be a person. AI pretends to have a relationship with you. It doesn't. And it is social trust. So in the same way you trust your phone, your search engine, your email provider, it is a tool. And like all of those things, it is a pretty untrustworthy tool. Right? Your phone, your email provider, your social networking platform, they all spy on you. Right? They are all operating against your best interest. My worry is that AI is going to be the same, that AI is fundamentally controlled by large for profit corporations. Hi, Bruce. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'd love to talk about uh, trust in AI, but before we get to that, can you just tell me what trust means to you? I wrote a book about trust. I don't see it on my bookshelf right now. Uh, it is an incredibly complex concept. And it has many meanings. It's an overloaded word, kind of like security. So asking what trust means to them, I think, is bad because it means many things in many contexts to everybody. There's a difference between trust and trustworthiness. Right? In, a, in a security context, trust is often something you have to trust, not something that's trustworthy. Uh, I do write about the difference between a more intimate uh, personal trust and social trust, but there's a lot of scholars about trust and they have very different definitions and it really depends on what angle you're taking. So I tend to keep it open because many people have different needs when they talk about the need for trust. And as a security person, we often have to provide for them all. But you know, in terms of AI, I think we should differentiate between interpersonal trust you might trust a friend, and a more social trust, you might trust a bank teller or an Uber driver. Can you just elaborate on that? Like, how are the, how is, like, what's the difference between interpersonal trust and social trust? Like, when would you need one or the other? You might need, it's not really about need, it's about the relationship. So interpersonal trust is you trusting a friend, right? It's based on your knowledge of them. It's less about their behavior and more about uh, their their inner selves. I trust a friend, I trust a spouse, I trust a relative. We know what that means. I don't know what they're going to do, but I kind of know it'll be informed by who they are. When I say I trust an Uber driver, it's a very different form of trust. right? I don't know this person. right? I, I don't even know their last name. I just met them. But I trust that their behavior means I'm going to get taken to my destination, right, safely. And they could be a bank robber at night. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. So for social trust, there are systems of society that enable that. I mean, the reason I don't just get in the car of random strangers, but I get in the car of random strangers who are Uber drivers, uh, there's an entire system based on surveillance, based on competition of a star rankings, based on whatever background checks Uber does, based on my history, based on, on their history, that enables us to trust each other in that interaction, right? Same thing when I hand cash over to a bank teller. I don't know who they are, I'm giving them my money, but I know there's an entire system that the bank has to allow me to trust that person in that circumstance. If we walked outside the bank down the block, I would never give that person my money, like ever. But in the bank, I would. And that's the difference. And it's a really important difference because social trust scales. Interpersonal trust is only based on who I know. It's not gonna be more than 100 people in society. And it'll probably be less than that. But social trust, I could trust thousands, millions of people, right? I flew in on an airplane yesterday. Think of all the people I trusted during that process, including like all the passengers not to leap over and attack me. And, you know, I mean, that, that's a little bit funny, but if we were chimpanzees, we couldn't do that. So social trust is a big deal. It is unique to humans and it's, it makes society work. So it seems like um, social trust is then going to be incredibly important when it comes to AI. So 
uh, in the same way that um, you mentioned the, the bank example, where there's hundreds of different people involved in sort of uh, creating all these systems to make sure that social trust works, what's the equivalent that's needed for trusting AI? So AI is interesting because AI pretends to be a person. AI pretends to have a relationship with you. It doesn't. And it is social trust. So in the same way you trust your phone, your search engine, your email provider, it is a tool. And like all of those things, it is a pretty untrustworthy tool. Right? Your phone, your email provider, your social networking platform, they all spy on you. Right? They are all operating against your best interest. My worry is that AI is going to be the same, that AI is fundamentally controlled by large for-profit corporations, that surveillance capitalism will be uh, you know, unavoidable as a business model, and these systems will be untrustworthy. You know, We want social trust with them, but we won't have it. And because they are relational, because they are conversational, they will fool us. Right? We will be fooled into thinking of them as friends and not as services. Whereas at best, they're going to be services. So I worry a lot about people uh, misplaced trust in AI. That certainly seems like uh, it could be a, a very big problem when you sort of start giving away all your sort of most personal details or intimate thoughts to uh, some AI that isn't actually as trustworthy. You know, but, but so, yeah, so yes and no, right? Already, your search engine knows more about you than your spouse, than your best friends, right? We never lie to our search engines. They know about our hopes, our dreams, our fears, whatever we're thinking about. You know, similarly, our social networking platforms know a lot about us. Our phones, right? They know where we go, who we're with, what we're doing. So we are already giving a lot of personal data to untrustworthy services. AI is going to be like that. And, you know, when I think about AI digital assistance, I think it's one of the holy grails of personal AI, an AI that will be my uh, travel agent and secretary and life coach and relationship counselor and, you know, concierge and all of those things. We're going to want it to know everything about us. We're going to want it to be intimate because it'll do a better job. And now, how do we make it so that right, it's not also spying on us? And that's going to be hard. So in terms of being able to know when it's appropriate to have those sort of um, trustworthy interactions or those intimate interactions, like, um, is there any way to gauge how trustworthy some AI is? Or have you just got to assume that it's, it's not trustworthy? We have to assume that the AIs that are run by Meta and by Google are, and by Microsoft and Amazon are going to be no more trustworthy than all of their other services. I mean, that would be foolish to think that Google, whose business model is spying on you, would make an AI that doesn't spy on you. I mean, maybe they won't, but that's not the way to bet. And, you know, surveillance capitalism is the business model of the internet. Like pretty much everything spies on us. Your car spies on you, your refrigerator spies on you. Right, your drones, I mean, whatever it is, you know, we, we see again and again how surveillance is pervasive in all of these systems. So we can't expect different here. And I think it'd be foolish if we did. You know, if we want different, we're going to have to legislate. It's our only hope. I think you're right that, like, at the moment, all the sort of most powerful AIs are created by these large technology companies. So you mentioned the idea of legislation. Like, is there, on, uh, is there an alternative to this sort of corporate AI? I push for the notion of uh, public AI. I think we should have at least one model out there. I don't need a lot. I, I just need one that is not built by a for-profit corporation for their own benefit. And it could be a university doing it. It could be a government doing it. It could be a consortium, uh, an, right, an NGO. And as long as it is public, and by this, I don't mean uh, a corporate model that has been made public domain. So the llama model doesn't count, right? That is still a corporate model, even though we have access to its details. It needs to be a model built ground up on, on sort of nonprofit principles. 
This feels important. Then you get a different kind of AI. I don't need it to dominate. I don't need it to, to transplant all the corporate AIs. I need it in the mix, right? I need it to be an option that people can choose and an option that we researchers can study in opposition to the corporate AI and sort of understand where the contours are. Uh, you know, it's not a big ask. Uh, models are expensive to build, but in the scheme of government expenditures, they're cheap. And models are getting cheaper all the time. But this feels important. You know, if we're to understand how much and how we can trust corporate AI, we're going to need non-corporate AI to compare it to. Right? Otherwise, we're not going to be able to make good decisions. Uh, so this is a really interesting idea, just having this sort of counterweight to the corporate AI, just having a, a public model. Um, so there are different sort of levels of um, openness. Uh, so, I know, for example, the meta models, they're sort of open weights, but they don't give you enough details yeah, to reproduce that's not enough. everything. So how, just talk me through how much of it needs to be open and publicly available. I think uh, all of it. I mean, built ground up by the public for the public. I mean, and, and in a way that requires political accountability, not just market accountability. So openness, transparency, responsive to public demands. Uh, so we know the training data. We know how it's trained. We, we have the weights. We have the model. And, and that now becomes something that anybody can build on top of. So universal access to the entire stack. Now this becomes a foundation for you know, a free market and AI innovations. Now we're getting some of that with both the Hugging Face model out of France and with the Llama model out of Meta, but they are still proprietarily built and then given to the public, which is not enough. We, you, you're not gonna get a model that isn't responsive in the same way to corporate demands. And maybe that doesn't matter, but we don't know if it doesn't matter yet. And I think we need to know. Right? This is just too important to solely give to you know, the near-term financial interests of a bunch of uh, tech billionaires. You know, we're gonna need a better way to think about this. And, I, and the goal isn't to make AI into friends, right? You're never gonna get interpersonal trust with AI. I mean, all I want is reliable service in the way Uber is a reliable service, even though, you know, I don't know, or, you know, in this interpersonal way, trust anybody involved in that system, right? The, the way the mechanism works allows me to use Ubers anywhere on the planet without even thinking about it. And that's kind of the way trust works well. Like when I get in an airplane, I don't even think about, you know, do I trust the, the pilot, the plane, the maintenance engineers? The, I mean, I know because of this social trust that Delta Airlines puts well-trained and well-rested crews in cockpits on schedule. I don't have to think about it, right? When I go to lunch in a, about an hour or so, I'm not going to walk into the kitchen and like check their sanitation levels. I know that there are health codes here in Cambridge, Massachusetts that will ensure that I'm not going to die of food poisoning. Like, are these perfect? No. People do occasionally get sick in restaurants. Airplanes occasionally fall out of the sky. But largely it's good enough. Right? And you know, there are Uber drivers that commit crimes against passengers. It's largely good enough. And actually, I think uh, Uber drivers are interesting. Taxi driver used to be one of the country's most dangerous professions. It was incredibly risky to be a taxi driver in a big city. And Uber changed that right through surveillance that enables this social trust. There's a, a lot to unpack there. I hadn't realized that taxi driver was such a, a dangerous occupation, but... It's interesting that um, these sort of additional regulations like, um, so uh, for example, you mentioned with restaurants, there are regulations around sanitation and making sure that the food is going to be uh, healthy and not going to put food poison people is sort of beneficial and helps in scale. I think a lot of people, when they say, okay, more regulation, their gut reaction is going to be, oh, well, regulation stops innovation. 
So what sort of regulation can you have for AI that is going to... So let's stop for a second. Regulation stops innovation is a bullshit argument given to you by people who don't want to be regulated. It is not true. Do, oh, do we have problems with innovation in healthcare? Do we have problems with innovation in automobile design? I, we put regulation in place because unfettered innovation kills people. I, so we're okay with it taking a few years for a drug to hit the market. Because if you get it wrong, people die. Same thing with airplanes. Uh, and if you wander around, I mean, I, what is the lack of innovation in restaurants in your city because of health codes? None. Zero. That is a fundamentally bullshit argument. Do not fall for it. That's one. Uh, two is if it inhibits innovation, maybe we're okay with that. Right? If innovation means people die, we want slower innovation. You can only move fast and break things if the things you break are not consequential. Once the things you break are life and property, then you can't move that fast. And if you don't like it, get into a different industry. I don't care. So I have no sympathy for companies that don't want to be regulated. That is the price for operating in society. And sometimes we regulate people out of business. But 150 years ago, we said to uh, you know, entire industry, you can't send five-year-olds up chimneys to clean them. Right? And if it hurts your business, too freaking bad. We no longer send five-year-olds up chimneys to clean them because we are more moral than that. Right? You can't sell pajamas that catch on fire. If it hurts your business model, get a new business model. You can't do it. So I'm okay with putting restrictions on corporations. Right? They exist because it is a clever way to organize capital right, and markets. That's it. They have no moral imperative to, to exist. Right? If Facebook can't exist without being regulated, I mean, I want Facebook to not spy, stop spying on its users. Right? If it can't exist because of that, maybe it goes away and gets replaced by a company that can do social networking without spying on their users. There's no rule that Facebook has to exist. Sorry, I'm a little strived on this. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you're giving your opinions. Um, so in that case, uh, what sort of regulations do you think should be, uh, do you think should apply to AI? In general, my feeling is we don't need a lot of new regulations for AI because we want to, what we want to regulate is the human behavior, right? So if an AI at a university is racist in their admissions policies, that's illegal. But if a human admissions official is racist, that's also illegal. I don't care whether it's an AI or an AI plus a human or a non-AI computer or, or, or an entirely human system, right? It's the output that matters. And that same thing that's true for loan applications or policing or any other place you're going to see bias. You know, if, if I am concerned about AIs creating fake videos in political campaigns, I'm equally concerned if those videos are made in a, you know, with actors in the soundstage. Like there's no difference. So in general, my feeling is that we want to regulate the behavior of the humans and not the tools they are using. Now, after saying that, AI is a certain type of tool and we'll need some specific rules, right? Just like we, like poisoning someone is illegal and also, we make it harder for average people to buy certain poisons, right? We do both. So there will be need to be some AI-specific rules, but in general, regulate the human behavior and not the AI. Because the humans are the ones who are morally responsible for what's going on. That certainly seems to help. Uh, I guess uh, people or managers become more accountable. It's like, okay, we're putting this AI tool into action, but um, actually we are responsible for what goes and, on. And it's the same if it's a non-AI tool, right? You, yeah. you put a tool in and a tool is an extension of your power and responsibility. So okay. if a tool does damage, then it's your, your fault. You know, and we have experience with this. You know, we, a lot of talk is about what happens when AI start killing, so AI start killing people. You know, robots have been killing people for decades. In, you know, there's a steady stream, not a lot, of industrial robot accidents. 
where people die. In the US, in Europe, in Asia, right? This is not new. So we have experience with robots and AI systems taking human life. And in general, it is. It, it's the company, it's the maintainers, it, it, you know, courts are good at figuring out, you know, who's at fault. And we we as a society have experience with that. That is not going to be a new thing. So it seems like existing laws are going to largely cover like the use cases of AI. If we let. Okay. So how do you feel about the sort of new raft of AI regulations then? So we've got the EU AI Act is sort of the most recent, but there are quite a few on the way. EU AI Act is really, I think, the only one that is real. I mean, US, we have an executive order, but you know, no one thinks Congress will be able to pass any AI regulation. We can't even regulate social media, and we've been trying for a while, a decade. So I'm not optimistic about, about regulating AI. The EU AI Act is good. I mean, it's a good first attempt. You can tell it, it, it exhibits the problems with regulation of the technology. Since so technology changes. Right? The EU AI Act is being written before generative AI becomes a thing. Then you know, GPT hits the mainstream. They're frantically rewriting. The law is kind of half and half. But you know, what is the big thing next year? And will the law cover it? And this is the problem of writing tech-specific laws. The tech changes, but doesn't change with the humans. But in general, I like the EU AI Act. It's a really good attempt. I like the idea that they breaking applications into four different uh, threat levels, right, and, and regulating differently. You know, I think we can do more. Uh, you know, we, from in banking is a good example. We regulate large banks more heavily than small banks. So banking regulation is key to how big you are, because we want to have, you know, we need regulation but we don't want to strangle little banks. Now, in tech, the big companies like regulation because you know, it, it weeds out the competition. And Facebook will be able to meet any regulation any government throws at it. It's Facebook's competition that won't. So you know, that kind of thinking is needed here. But the tech is moving so fast. So we're going to need a regulatory environment that is flexible and agile. And we're not good at that at society. So uh, is, it should be the larger companies that have more regulation or the, uh, yeah. the larger AI models? That I think have that's more something we have to at least think about. I, mean, I don't have answers here, but I kind of have been poking at the questions. But yes, looking at uh, some kind of tiered approach, I think would be interesting here. If we're just looking at regulations, then that's going to put a lot of burden on governments to... Um, Great trust in AI. Are there any things beyond regulation we can do to increase trust? I think not. I mean, corporations are fundamentally untrustworthy. I mean, you cannot have a, a, a interpersonal trust relationship with them. You can have a social trust relationship with them, but corporations are, are precisely as immoral as the law will get let them get away with. That's that's the way it works, right? The you know government establishes the rules, and the market plays on top of the rules. If we want to force more trust, you need regulation. It's it, you know no company, no industry has improved safety or security without being mandated by the government, like ever. And it's planes, it's trains, automobiles, pharmaceuticals, workplace, uh, food and drugs, consumer goods. Right? I mean, these are all industries that produce dangerous things until they were forced not to. The market doesn't reward safety and security in the same way. And the market rewards fake trust just as much as real trust, especially when you have individuals working in a near-term uh, reward horizon. So you've got these market failures where you need non-market mechanisms. So if you need regulation, is it going to have to be every country is sort of making its own regulations, or do we need some kind of uh, global uh, synchronization here? Global synchronization doesn't exist, so it doesn't matter what you need. You're not getting it. <laughs> I'm I'm fine with countries doing their own things. This is again, companies complain. There's you know lots of regulations. It's hard to meet them all. And again, my response is too freaking bad. Get used to it. Like you're a corporation, internet. You're a multinational corporation. If you can't handle it, don't be a multinational corporation. This isn't hard. And so I'm okay with a patchwork. I'm okay with a patchwork of states. 
Right? We, we have uh, state privacy rules that are different in every state. Meta's doing just fine. They complain a lot, but they're doing just fine. So I'm good with a patchwork. I don't think you're going to get international harmonization like anytime soon because we can't get it on even easier things. And this is just moving so fast. You know, we don't have planetary government. I suppose, yeah, certainly probably pros and cons of having a planetary government. And uh, yeah, maybe the patchwork is best, at least for now. Um, so now, I'm actually a fan of planetary government. I think in general, we as a species have two sets of problems. We have global problems and we have local problems. We no longer have like France-sized problems. So I tend to like government that is very big and very small right now. The medium size seems to, I mean, it was very important in an industrial age, but it seems less important today. That is a bigger conversation than this. Yeah, I feel like it's a whole podcast episode. Um, all right, so one thing that seems to have come up in conversation a few times already is social media. And it seems like, Social media went from like being the sort of darling, of like this is going to save democracy and with things like the <laughs> Arab Spring and all this sort of like 10, 15 years ago and to being like kind of like, yeah, this is causing a lot of problems. And uh, yeah, it's widely sort of, uh, well, there's disillusionment anyway. Um, so are there any lessons that the AI industry can learn from social media? So yes, and actually I wrote a, an essay, it appeared in I, the MIT Tech Journal like last month called Five lessons AI can learn from social media, where I talk about the, our inability to regulate social media and uh, you know causing all these problems and how we can learn from their mistakes. And it's things like virality, it's things like surveillance, lock-in, in monopolization. I think that's the big one, that uh, the biggest problem with social media is that they're monopolies. And that means they just don't have to be responsive to their users or their customers, which are the, the, the advertisers actually, but, but their users most importantly. And, and anything we can do to break up the tech monopolies will be incredibly valuable in, in, in all of this. And that's the biggest lesson. So you think um, in this case, I guess for anyone who's thinking about regulation, you should think, well, okay, these AI companies, they're going to be monopolies and therefore you need to regulate them as monopolies. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, monopolization as a, if you're a monopoly, you have a lot more power to shape the market and not respond basically to, uh, to market demands, right? You can uh, operate outside, you know, the basic tenets of a capitalist market system, and and that and that breaks that breaks the system. So I need there to be competition. I need I need sellers to compete for buyers. Right? That is how I get a vibrant market. And if sellers aren't competing with each other for buyers, you don't have that dynamic. And that's what's really important. Um, and do you think that sort of that monopoly market is going to be inevitable for uh, for AI, particularly for generative AI, or do you think there will of be that? Of course, it's not case? inevitable. It's, it's 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 only enabled by the ability of corporations to ignore antitrust law. You know, we have laws in place to try to protect, protect prevent monopolies. We didn't enforce them for a few decades, which is why we have the big tech monopolies. Uh, they are starting to be enforced again now, but you know the the power imbalance is great. So we'll see how. Uh, how it goes, but you know, EU is doing better than the US. And in a sense, the EU is the regulatory superpower of the planet. I mean, I look to them more than the US to, uh, you know, to keep these companies in check. It occurs to me that we've been talking about um, corporations as being this sort of like single entity, but actually they consist of people and in terms yeah, of people. I mean, that's, sort of but that's, that's kind of a, I mean, no, what's his name said that? Romney said that. I mean, it, it's, it's true and it's bullshit. They are, uh, Charlie Stroh, science fiction writer, talks about corporations as slow AI. It's a really interesting parallel that yes, they're people, but they are this socio-technical organism. And they have, things they do are, are greater than the, the individual people. It's like saying that a car is, is like, you know, metal and screws. I mean, yes and no. And, you know, if you think about it, 
And let's take Meta. I mean, Meta could decide tomorrow not to surveil its people. And if they did, the CEO would be fired and replaced with a less ethical CEO. Right? The people can't operate like with full autonomy because of the system they're embedded in. So corporations are not just a bunch of people in a room. They are a highly structured, multi-human entity. And you cannot reduce them to just people. I suppose that's true. There are certainly limits on things I could say, like I would never tell people it's a terrible idea to learn about data and AI, because that's they what are I do. Immortal. I mean, they're immortal in a way that, that the people aren't, right? They outlive the people in them. The people in them come and go. It's like your skin cells, right? You know, the cells in your body come and go, but who you are is greater than a pile of cells. Maybe that's a better analogy. Well, we're skin cells as part of a, a human corporation or something. All right. Um, so just human me from above, though. So within the corporations, there are people who are sort of building these AI tools, who are working on these things, and we have a lot of them listening in the audience. So do you have any advice for the people who are building uh, AI or making use of AI um, at work? Like what do they need to do um, to create more trustworthy AI or can yeah. they have some sort of effect? I think really pay attention to applications. It matters to applications. And I, you know, if I have an AI that's a political candidate chatbot and it you know, says we should nuke New Zealand, right? that's a gaffe. If I have a AI chatbot that's helping someone fill out immigration paperwork and it makes a mistake, they get deported. Right? So the use matters a lot. What is the cost of failure? What is the trust environment? Is it adversarial? Is it not? Right? If I have an AI that is advising me, you know, in corporate negotiations, you know, how much does it matter if the AI's parent company is on the other side of those negotiations? So pay attention to the use case a lot. And, and that really determines whether it makes sense. Like AI assistants are doing uh, a lot of legal work. As long as there are human lawyers reviewing it, that's fantastic, right? It makes lawyers more effective. So think about how the human and AIs interact. Think about uh, the systems and the trust that needs to be in the system, the cost of getting it wrong in addition to how often things get, get wrong. And, and notice that that will change all the time, right? This, this field is moving incredibly fast. What is true today won't be true in six months. So any decision you make needs to be constantly revisited. I think that's quite important, like think about what goes wrong. Because often when you're building something, you think, well, just can I make something that gives the right answer sometimes? But think about how it can be misused. Think about what happens when it fails is equally important. Um, and how about for people who are just using AI? Is there anything um, they can do in order to uh, make sure that AI becomes more trustworthy over you time? Know, you know, add to better laws is the answer, but really no. I mean, like, you know, AI is already embedded in your mapping software, right? I mean, the AI is giving you directions. What could you do? You either use it or you don't, right? I mean, AI is controlling your feed on TikTok or Facebook. What are your options? There aren't any. So really for us as consumers, the AIs are handed to us embedded in systems. And that's pretty much like all tech. And we either choose to use the systems or not. Uh, this is where the monopolies are a problem because often we have no choice. I mean, I mean, I can tell you, like, don't get a cell phone, but that's like dumb advice in the 21st century. It's not real, that, that's not viable. So again, I need government to step in and ensure that, you know, you can use the cell phone without, without it being too, too bad. And most people believe they have more protections in their consumer goods than they do. You know, with, with phones and interconnected cars and, and, you know, there's a story that broke a couple of weeks ago about GM spying on its uh, drivers and selling information to insurance companies. People were surprised there. I was surprised. Like Kashmir Hill, who writes about privacy for the New York Times, was surprised. You know, but should we be surprised? No, but we believe like we have more protections than we do. So it seems like 
if we don't have those protections, then that's going to break down the social trust then, uh, to go back to your original point. I, I mean, it, and it does. And I think this is why you're seeing what we mentioned a little bit earlier, this backlash against social media. You know, we thought it was all good. Now we think it's all bad. I mean, the truth is in the middle, but, it, you know, we thought we could trust them. It seems like there are some sort of good possible futures and some bad possible futures. Um, what's your sort of ideal situation here? Like what happens next that you think will make things go well? I think that AI as assistive tech is phenomenal. And, and I mean, a lot of what goes well is human plus AI. And a lot of go, what goes poorly is AI replacing human, at least today, right? A few years, it might be different. So the more we leverage these technologies to enhance humans and really to enhance human flourishing, the better we're going to do. Now, that is not necessarily where the market's going to push. Market will push towards replacement because that is cheaper. But that has a lot of downstream effects, right? You know, massive job loss is just not good for society. And we might want to think about ways to, you know, ways to help people that aren't tied to their jobs. In the United States, all of your stuff is tied to your job. I mean, unlike Europe, right? The U.S., right, in Europe, they got healthcare through the political process. In the U.S., we got healthcare through collective bargaining. And that didn't matter in the 50s. They both worked. But here we are in this decade. It means your healthcare is tied to your job in a way it's not in Europe. And that's not serving us well right now. So if we're going to see massive unemployment because of AI, we need to figure out some other way to deliver basic human services that aren't tied to your job. So that's not great because we as a society really have trouble doing all these things. So that's kind of meandered a bit here. Get me back on track. <laughs> no, uh, that's, that, we started off going down the happy path and then sort of turned into disasters. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, happy, I think there's an enormous <laughs> power in AI. I am mostly optimistic. I, mean, I know I'm a security person and I say a lot of pessimistic things, but I am mostly optimistic here. I think this will be incredibly powerful for democracy, for society. And uh, so that's, that's a lot of what I'm writing about now. And I think it's true. So maybe we'll try and finish on a happy note. So what is it that you're most optimistic about? I think there's enormous power in AI as a mediator and moderator and consensus builder. And, and a lot of the things I think AI will do for us are things humans can perfectly capably do. We just don't have enough humans. So putting an AI moderator in every Reddit group, uh, in local online government meetings and in, in, you know, citizen assemblies on different issues be incredibly powerful. AI doing adjudication. Uh, I think AI as sense maker explaining to people political issues. AI is an infinitely patient teacher. So instead of reading a book, you engage in a conversation. I think it makes you a better person if we can get that working at scale. I think enormous values of AI as a doctor. I mean, there are parts of this planet where people never see a doctor because there aren't enough doctors. Right? But an AI-assisted nurse will be just as good in, in almost all cases. I mean, there's phenomenal potential there. AI is doing research, especially research that is like big data pattern matching. We're seeing articles about AI and drug discovery. I think there's a lot of, of potential there. And so really, I look for places where there aren't enough humans to do the work. And AI can make the humans that are doing the work more effective. Lots of uh, incredibly positive things there. I really like the idea of um, an AI moderator. That's something that hasn't cropped up in many discussions, really. So that that's pretty... Uh, of course, I just said that you are replaceable in this podcast. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, there is a story about, about a few months ago. I was interviewed by a podcaster back like last summer. ChatGPT is becoming a big thing initially, and they said I went to ChatGPT and asked a bunch of interview questions. I asked it to come up with interview questions for you, and and here they are, and they were fantastic interview questions. Like one of them was, if you were an action figure, what was it? What would your accessories be? 
Like, <laughs> I've never gotten that question before. That's brilliant. Okay, so I don't guess, ask that. I guess my days are numbered as a as a podcast. Maybe look out for AI Richie. It, um, isn't there an NPR episode on AI where they had the AI come up with a podcast uh, and it asked questions and it came up with a little sketch uh, on the topic? It's most like three part. Look it up. I I think it was some NPR program. It might have been all things considered. Absolutely. Actually, I just recently saw. Um, Reed Hoffman interviewing an AI version of himself, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that was exciting. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's getting very close uh, to yeah. Richie is replaceable. Um, all right, so uh, just to finish up, uh, do you have any advice uh, for people? Is there like some action you think people should take in order to you know get towards this happy path of uh, AI being good? I, I mean, to me, this has to become a political issue. And nothing will change unless government forces it. And government will not force it unless we, the people, demand it. I mean, I want these things discussed at presidential debates. I mean, I want them to be political issues that people campaign on, like that matter, in the same way that inflation matters, and unemployment matters, and, and you know, US-China policy matters. It needs to matter to us, otherwise, the tech monopolies are going to just roll over the uh, the government because that, that's what they do, right? They have the money, they have the lobbying, and it's very hard to get a uh, policy that the money doesn't want. It's really hard. I think uh, call to action there for everyone to start writing letters to their, uh, their local uh, representative. To get their AIs to write letters to the local representative. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should write letter. There we go. Technology solving the problem again. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Bruce. That was brilliant. Good luck. Thank you. 